Beware, citizen. You are now departing from the world of allowable opinion. The Tom Woods Show. Welcome, everybody. It is Wednesday, January 22nd, 2014. You ever seen one of those articles that says, oh my gosh, if the libertarians ever were victorious, our society would be so terrible and the corporations would be dominating everybody and all our sandwiches would be poisoned and all that sort of thing? Well, we're going to take on one of those articles today with the help of Jacob Hornberger of the Future of Freedom Foundation. I'm going to bring him on in just a minute. But just a reminder, make sure you subscribe to this program on iTunes or Stitcher or anywhere else where you get your podcasts. Because, as I mentioned last week, I am putting together an ebook full of the transcripts of all the exciting interviews we did on this program in 2013. And I'm going to be giving it away to you listeners for free. And if you want to know how to get your hands on that, you're going to have to listen into the program. And the best way to make sure you don't miss a single episode is to subscribe on iTunes, on Stitcher, or to subscribe to the newsletter at TomWoods.com or at TomWoodsRadio.com. All right, Jacob Hornberger is the founder and president of the Future of Freedom Foundation, which you can check out at FFF.org. We had his vice president on, Sheldon Richmond, not too long ago to talk about separating school and state. So if you missed that program, you can check that baby out in the archives. But right now, it's my great pleasure to welcome Jacob Hornberger to the program. Thanks so much for being here. Oh, it's nice to be with you, Tom. It's an honor. Now, I wanted to talk about this article from Alternet anyway, and then when I happened to be fishing around to see if anybody had commented on it, and I saw you had commented on it, I thought, well... I wanted to have Hornberger on anyway, so I just put it all together, and it seemed like a good idea. So this article, I already told the listeners about it, what America would look like if libertarians got their way. It seems like there's an article like this every couple of months somewhere. And I, I want you to, first of all, tell me, do you think it's just because of my selective reading of websites that I seem to come across a lot of anti-libertarian articles? Or is it the case, is it your experience, too, that it seems that there are more anti-libertarian articles, like articles attempting to debunk the whole philosophy, than there are, say, anti-conservative articles. I mean, yeah, there are articles saying this Republican politician's a bum, but how many articles are there that try to dissect conservatism the way we see libertarianism being dissected? Do you think I'm onto something here? I have I haven't seen this many articles attacking libertarianism in the you know 25 years that I've been doing this here at the Future okay. Freedom Foundation and I think it's because they sense that we are making enormous strides in uh, attracting people to our philosophy especially people that are young the college students and the high school students that are all self-identifying as libertarians I think the the left really finds us threatening yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm I, glad you said that, because that was how I was interpreting it, and I thought, maybe I'm just looking at the world through rose-colored glasses, but I think a lot of the progressives especially take for granted the young people are supposed to be progressives, and they're disappointed that there is this substantial minority of them that aren't buying into it, and hence you get these articles about if the libertarians won, you know, everyone would be starving, and if they had food, it would all be poisoned by the capitalists or whatever. So I want to go through this this piece with you, and I have to say, I'll give this article credit. It doesn't go the poison sandwiches route. You know, it doesn't do that. That we'd, we the, the pollution would be choking us to death, and the kids would be working in coal mines. And it's not that. It's it's a little bit different. But so so let's go through and see what the what the criticisms are. He says. Uh, He's talking about cutting unemployment benefits. Now, I mean, that seems like an odd thing to attack, I mean, of, of all possible issues to bring up. But they're talking about, apparently, Senator Rand Paul and other conservatives talking about unemployment benefits, increasing unemployment. And the author of this article cannot believe that anyone could be such a blockhead as to think there could be a relationship between unemployment benefits and unemployment. What say you? Well, obviously, incentives matter. I mean, it, it's entirely rational for people to take free money. I mean, that's what we have long argued. But I think it's important to put things in a much bigger context because it's easy to to, to look at the the system we we exist in today, the the regulated society, the welfare state, and find these distortions and and criticize 
you know, libertarian positions on one aspect of this, but usually it's it's conservatives that are doing this. I think it's better to look at this in an overall perspective, that this is not an economic system that libertarians favor. So we're not here defending the status quo as the left sometimes betrays us as doing. We oppose the status quo. And so you've got all of these barriers to to employment, for example, licensure laws, economic regulations, exorbitant taxes that inhibit starting new businesses, uh, minimum wage laws that, that prevent people from starting new businesses and hiring people at low wages. And so when you've got all these barriers involved, it's not surprising that some people might find it hard to work. When I when I see a person on the, on the side of the street saying, hey, unemployed needs some help, I don't automatically jump to the conclusion that, oh, get a job, you bum, because I know that there's tremendous barriers that the state has imposed to employment. So I think it's important that when we're talking about libertarianism that we present the big picture on this thing, and that is a totally radical free market, a market that is entirely free of government control, regulation, and taxation. I would add to that the, the issue of the economic crisis and business cycle that we've been through, that these things don't just occur spontaneously. There's a government or Federal Reserve angle to be observed there as well. Let, let me show you one passage, though, just on the subject of unemployment uh, benefits, just because it's interesting. This is a passage from a mainstream economics textbook, and it reads as follows. People respond to incentives. If unemployment becomes more attractive because of the unemployment benefit, some unemployed workers may no longer try to find a job or may not try to find one as quickly as they would without the benefit. Ways to get around this problem are to provide unemployment benefits only for a limited time or to require recipients to prove they are actively looking for a new job. You know whose textbook that is? That's Paul, huh. Krug that's Paul Krugman's textbook. You're kidding. Wow. <laughs> yeah. That's a shocker. Yeah. But Bob Murphy, the, the Krugman slayer, dug that baby up the other day. That's hilarious. Yeah, so there it is in black and white. So right. So even Paul Krugman's a terrible, wicked, capitalist pig, it turns out. But I, I love your point about this big picture thing, because we do. And you know what? I'm, I'm as guilty of this as anyone else sometimes, of acting as if the current system is something we have to rush to defend when the current system is as far opposed from what we would want as it probably is from what a progressive would want. Well, that's right. That's right. That, that um, you know, I think this is one of the things that distinguishes us from conservatives. That the conservatives look at the status quo and they, they get into these big debates about whether there should be you know, Obamacare or not Obamacare. And um, it's all quite irrelevant because it's this system of statism that we live under, a regulated society, a welfare state, a managed economy, uh, the central bank, as you point out. Libertarians are opposed to this entire system. So when we see bad things happening, like chronic unemployment in the inner cities among black teenagers, we know what the cause of that is. This is these are the status minimum wage laws that are going into and uh, that have been in effect. And so what we do, we talk in terms of a radical free market, a libertarian paradigm where you you separate economy and the state the way our ancestors separated church and state. You know, they're saying in this first point, uh, the, the author is claiming that our argument is that a lot of these welfare state programs create dependency. And so he says, well, then by that logic, we ought to close down the homeless shelters, shut down the Salvation Army, Army make it illegal to throw a starving person a coin or toss a blanket over them as they lay on the street. And this logic only ends one way, in a hellish dystopia where the underclass is starving, homeless, and dying in droves. How do you answer that? It's entirely different when you're talking about private sector uh, charity, because the, the charity is the, the ones that I've been familiar with are very, very cautious on how they distribute their money. Uh, they make sure that, that people really do need the, the assistance, but they are also encouraging them to get off the assistance uh, so that they can allocate the resources to the more urgent needs. It's entirely different from government. Government's incentive is to keep people on the dole. That way they're able to control them. They're able to implicitly threaten them that, hey, if the Republicans come in office, you're going to lose your dole. Let's stick with the Democrats type thing. Or scare seniors, oh my gosh, you're going to lose your Social Security. So it's always in, in, the, in the government's 
interest to make this dependency as long as it can, sometimes through an entire lifetime of a person. Now, I remember a guy many years ago telling me that he was living in a public housing project, and he told me that if he made too much money, that they would throw him out. And so his incentive was to stay in this public housing project because he, he could never accumulate enough money to to get the, the 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 large enough house for his family. So there he sits the rest of his life. Compare that to a private sector person providing low-cost housing for people. He doesn't care how long the person stays there. He just charges them for the, the, the rent, and uh, they can leave whenever they want. They can make as much money as they want. They can save as much money. The private sector and the government sector have two completely different incentive structures here. And, of course, if you're a potential donor to a private sector organization, you're not going to want to know how many people are sitting there on the dole, so to speak, right now. It's how many lives have you actually transformed, right? What has been the end game of somebody coming through here? I mean, do you have stories of people who get on their feet and carry on? Whereas with government, it's always this is how many people we're serving. In other words, this is how many people we're keeping in the same situation year after year. Now, the next point in this piece yeah, is, Let me interrupt oh, yeah. oh, just, please do. just for a second. Yeah. That, you know, that's an interesting point you make, because it's also how they, they're measuring the, the, the uh, success of their so-called war on poverty. They, you know, the 50th anniversary we're celebrating mm-hmm. now, is that they're saying, look at all the people we have put on the dole over the last 50 years. Well, I look at that, and I'm, <laughs> that's my measure of failure. Uh, that, 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 you know, what is the best way to help the poor? The best way you could ever help the poor is to have a system where the poor are able to become wealthy, where you they, they make it out on their own, and they, they break the, 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 the bonds of poverty, they become middle class, they become wealthy. That's my measure of success, where poor are independent. They're, they're not dependent on the government. They've done it on their own. They, they're working in a business or they own their own business and so forth. And I think that's another distinguishing characteristic here between the libertarian paradigm and the, uh, the leftist paradigm. And of course, the vast majority of progress that's been made against poverty in the United States or around the world occurred long before the major welfare state programs were even in place. It was just because The market economy was increasing wealth for everybody, and people's living standards increased by 10, 15 times in the the course of a single century. Nothing like this had ever been seen before. So, I I mean, it's hard for me to seriously believe that they think that they're accurately describing our views. And, in fact, most of the libertarians I know are basically young kids, uh, or, or they're just regular Americans who make a you know, fairly average income. Most of them are not the super wealthy. The super wealthy tend to be people who want stability. They don't want radical change. The system has served them well. They don't want to upset the apple cart. That's my experience. How about yours? I totally agree with you. And I think one of the things that that characterizes progressives, leftists, is that they notice in this article they don't they don't really have a, a sound understanding of economics in terms of what creates wealth in a society. They they just assume that there is this giant pool of wealth, and they see it, and they think it's unfair that there's some that have more, and so all they want to do is confiscate it from those who have it and give it to those who need it. So they don't they don't sit there and say, how does that wealth come into existence? Or if they do, they, they ascribe it to natural resources or some nonsense like that. Yeah. Well, we understand. I mean, this this is the real key to libertarianism. We understand what is what is necessary to create a wealthy, prospering society, one that benefits the poor because they they have the opportunity to become wealthy or middle class. And I think that's one of the things that we always have to focus on. What is it that creates wealth and prosperity in the society? And if if the poor people ever were to discover this aspect of libertarianism, I think the whole gig would be up on the whole welfare state regulated economy. Well, you have to ask yourself, where in the world would you rather be poor? I mean, look at Japan. What resources does Japan have? It has no oil. It's mostly mountainous. You would think this is going to be a complete disaster, whereas you would think, according to the resource explanation, Africa should be a paradise, right? It's got diamonds, it's got mineral deposits, it, this should be great. But it turns out that the regimes that are in charge in the different places have an effect on, on the standard of living. And you can even see that among African countries. I'd rather live in Botswana 
than I would in, well, Kenya or practically any other African country I can think of. Now, I want to share this one with you, though, because... Yeah, can I say one more thing? Yeah, please. On, no, on that. Yeah, yeah that, that, that's really a great point. I mean, I grew up in Laredo, Texas, right on the border. And right across the river was Nuevo Laredo, Mexico. And Mexico, of course, has oil. And yet there was there was there was tremendously more much more poverty in Nuevo Laredo, Mexico than Laredo. And as I was growing up, you know, I couldn't understand this. It's like, well, how does the river, the Rio Grande, uh, cause this disparity of wealth? Well, as you put it, those people in societies where government is taxing less, regulating less, interfering with economic activity less are the ones where there's going to be the higher standard of living, especially for the poor people. Because there's a huge spillover effect living as a poor person in a, in a wealthy society. I saw it in Laredo with a nun. Uh, she had taken a vow of poverty, and, and yet she lived a very nice life, a much nicer life than her counterparts, say, in Guatemala. She had a nice car that she drove. She didn't own it, but she had nice living facilities, nice library. And so... There's a tremendous spillover effect in, in, a, in a free market society, and I'm not suggesting that that's what the United States is, but clearly there's less government intrusion in, in, in our economic activities here than there, there is like in Africa or Mexico. or Another example is East and West Berlin. I mean, what better example could you have than that? East and West Berlin, I mean, when you would watch people fleeing East Berlin in the most desperate circumstances, and there used to be... There used to be apartment buildings alongside, right, right along with the division between the city, and eventually they bricked up the windows because people were jumping out the window. They'd be jumping from the third or fourth, fifth story window. They would they would send light signals out to the fire brigade on the other side saying, "I'm going to be jumping Tuesday morning at ten o'clock, so make sure the net is out for me." It's just <laughs> incredible what people would would do. Now I want to go on to the second one because okay. the other claim is the uh, title of this section is nothing but competition. And it says, this idea lies at the heart of libertarian and conservative thinking, that, that human beings excel under the pressure of competition. And the counter-argument that's raised here is a reference to a Sears CEO who did severe damage to Sears with the idea that internal competition among his company's departments would cause them to function more efficiently, and they didn't. And this is supposed to, this is an argument, he says, against the idea of competition. What was your response to that when you read that? Well, that, you know, the libertarian paradigm doesn't make any judgment calls as to how a particular company in a, an unhampered market should be managed. Uh, if, if a company is mismanaged or if consumers don't like what that company's uh, producing, it's going to go out of business or it's going to lose market share. So we don't, it, it, you know, a comparable example is education. We want to free the, the educational market. But we don't necessarily say, this is your best method of education. We, we let consumers make that decision. So by him pointing to Sears and saying, look at what this guy did. He established internal competition, and therefore competition itself is bad, is ridiculous. For one thing, what we're fighting for is not necessarily competition. We want freedom. Uh, in which involves competition and cooperation. It's 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 a system where people work together uh, to to satisfy their 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 mutual wants. And so that was my reaction. Is like, who cares what the guy at Sears was doing? That has nothing to do with freeing the economy and letting every company operate the way it wants and try to to gain market share by satisfying consumers by producing what they want. And of course, he he himself goes on to say. That, that what the Sears CEO did caused Sears stock to lose more than half its value. Well, there you go. That's what a free economy does. It punishes him for this. It's because you have a stock market where you're allowed to freely trade titles to capital, your uh, titles to uh, ownership of, of a company, that he was immediately punished for this. It's because, and if we didn't have competition, if we didn't have other firms that hadn't gone down his road, we wouldn't really have a way of gauging whether this had been a good or a bad thing. We wouldn't be able to take our money and bring it to some other company. So it, he's, in effect, proving the value of competition, that not all companies decided to adopt that model, and so the ones that didn't prospered, and they won out in the competitive battle. But also, you're right. It, it's, if you look at the whole division of labor and the structure of production, that's cooperation on a large scale. I'm cooperating with my suppliers. I'm cooperating with my retailers. I don't want to see either one of them go out of business because then the whole chain's disrupted and we all lose. 
So it's it's extremely short sighted to look at this and see nothing but dog eat dog. But now I turn to the hard one. Okay, because I'm going to skip the free enterprise zones one because that's kind of a Jack Kemp thing. I was never that big on it. But the last one is that uh, horror of horrors, we believe in the absolute rights of private ownership. And so, of course, the first argument that comes up here is, well, then this means that you're against uh, anti-discrimination laws. And and th- this would mean that you believe that a private owner can decide which person which group of people are allowed to come onto his property and which are not. And we all know this is a terrible thing. Now, this is probably one of the toughest arguments. I'll, I'll grant him he's raised a good one here. This, this one's actually a good one, unlike the other ones. How do you handle this argument? Well, I feel that, that, that a free society entails the right to discriminate on any basis. I mean, that's what freedom of association is. I mean, if, 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 a, if a bigot doesn't want to hang around with Catholics or Protestants or Jews or blacks or Hispanics or whatever, I think that's his right. I mean, that's, that's one of the fundamental aspects of liberty. But as you point out, the, the free market has a tendency to put a penalty on that type of conduct. Um, that, that That's why I often argue that they should have just repealed the segregation laws, that is, the laws that required people to separate in, in races. And the reason they had that is because they they knew that blacks were out competing whites to a large extent, and that's why they needed the Jim Crow laws to, to force people to segregate. If they had just repealed those laws or nullified them, then and let the market operate, the bigot would be still able to sell only to whites, but he would have been lost market share. There would have been social ostracism. People would have avoided the business. They could have demonstrated, boycotted the business. That, to me, is a much better way to treat uh, social misconduct, if you will, than to use the force of government, because all the government does is just force it underground. It, it, it suppresses like a steam cooker. It doesn't, doesn't eliminate the bigotry. It just prevents the bigot from, from uh, demonstrating his bigotry. I say, let freedom reign. Let the bigot do his thing and see what happens in the marketplace. In my opinion, the marketplace is going to put him out of business or at least severely penalize him. I would say, especially in the age of the Internet, where nobody can get away with anything for three seconds without it being a YouTube that the whole world is watching, it would be almost impo- you would be boycotted out of existence in five seconds by the whole world, basically. It would be extremely difficult, especially in this day and age, to, to carry that out. But now, what do you say, though, to then, then he carries on to say that in Rand Paul's style of libertarianism, and, and by the way, I think if, if he's that scared of Rand Paul, I mean, you know, he'd be terrified of you and me, but in, in <laughs> Rand Paul's libertarianism, there's, there is no limit to the deeds a business owner can commit inside the confines of his own business. Even if laws against theft and murder are upheld, that would almost certainly mean an end to all workplace safety laws much less minimum wage laws. Now, we, we hit on minimum wage laws a, a bit, but what about this? I mean, what, what about this claim that if we didn't have government workplace safety laws, which are, this is the implication here, well, everybody would basically be teetering on the, the edge of a, a, a you know, the, the, everybody would be on the verge of falling into a, a meat grinder and their body would be ground up into sausage meat that you and I would be buying in the supermarket, basically. Well, yeah, it's a variation of the child labor you know, uh, argument that you know, in the 19th century, American parents hated their children, and that's why they <laughs> sent them into the factories to work all day long and so forth. Well, you know, when, when you've got a certain level of, of, of uh, prosperity in a society, you can afford to do a lot of things. Um, or you, you might not be able to afford to do a lot of things. The reason children were sent into the factories is just basic survival. But as you reach a higher level of prosperity, more capital in that society, then all people have a higher standard of living, then all of a sudden you can start taking children out of the marketplace, out of the, out of the workplace. Wives can stay home, take care of their children. It's the same thing with safety regulations, that as your, your degree of wealth increases in the society, Businesses become safer. It's in their interest to become safer. They want to attract the, the workers, the better workers. And so here again, you have the incentive 
where it's in everybody's interest to have as many businesses entering the marketplace as possible. This is what I was talking about earlier, all these barriers to new businesses, including minimum wage laws, where if you have the more businesses in there competing for workers, there's that tendency to raise wages through that competitive effort, but there's also the, the, the incentive to say, hey, look, we've got a safer business here. We've got better working conditions over here. Come and work over here. And that's why it's in everyone's interest, especially the workers, to have as many businesses in there competing for their, for their labor as possible. And then, of course, once some particular improvement in the workplace environment, like, for example, even something like air conditioning becomes more common, then those firms that aren't offering air conditioning now have to pay higher wages to draw people toward you know the, the sweatshop conditions that they have. And as time goes on, they don't want to keep paying that wage premium, so they just go ahead and install the air conditioning. So uh, that's exactly right. I, and plus, I sometimes ask people, do you think even, let's say the government didn't require anything of anybody, in 2014, would you still want to buy a car that has the same amenities and safety features as a car from 1935 had? You know, would you want to buy a car with no windshield wipers? I mean, like, would you really want that? I mean, probably on your own, you would say, well, now that I'm wealthier and I can afford a car with windshield wipers, doggone it, I think I'm going to buy it. Now, before I let you go, I want you to tell us, just take a minute, tell us about the Future of Freedom Foundation. G- give me your best plug for what it is you guys do over there. Well, we're obviously a libertarian foundation that advances an un- uncompromising case for the free society. And so half the time we're talking about the, the welfare state and how this is a tremendous infringement on economic liberty, and we're building the case, a positive case for a radical free market society. We strongly oppose the drug war, which we believe is a classic example of, uh, of infringements on human liberty. And then we spend half our time on civil liberties, the critical importance of civil liberties to a free society. We oppose all this foreign interventionism, the empire, CIA, NSA, and its massive super-secret surveillance schemes. We would dismantle the whole national security state. And so we're, we're showing people why free society necessarily depends on a, on a on a constitutional republic, not this uh, empire, militarist empire that we're, we've been living under for so many years. Well, everybody, I, I strongly urge you to check out the website FFF.org. How's that for easy to remember? I want you to check that out because I would say after 9-11 in particular, you could count on one hand, I would say, the number of, of major libertarian outfits that didn't at least in one way or another get caught up in the jingoism and the hyper-patriotism of that time. And among the handful that kept a clear head, even if it meant they were going to be abused and attacked, was the Future of Freedom Foundation. So you can't go wrong by checking them out. And Jacob Hornberger, I really appreciate your time today. Thanks again. Thank you, Tom. It's an honor to be on your show, and thanks for those nice comments. All right, that's it for today's program. Tomorrow, it's going to be Bob Murphy. We're going to talk about this Letter from the economists, including seven Nobel laureates, saying we've got to raise the minimum wage. We're going to talk about what that's all about. And we're going to take your questions. Thanks for submitting them in my thread on Facebook and via Twitter. I'm on Twitter at Thomas E. Woods, and you can like my page on Facebook, facebook.com slash Thomas E. Woods. That's where you can find me on Facebook. Don't forget also my upcoming speaking schedule. February 7th, Washington College, Chestertown, Maryland. February 8th, Grove City College in Grove City, Pennsylvania. March 1st, the College of Southern Idaho in Twin Falls, Idaho. And March 15th, the University of Central Arkansas. Get details about these events on my events page at TomWoods.com. TomWoods.com slash events. Friday, it's Walter Williams. What should I ask Walter Williams? Tweet me some questions at Thomas E. Woods using hashtag AskWalter. Or I've got a thread already up and running on Facebook, facebook.com slash Thomas E. Woods. Let's get your two cents in there as well. Let me know what you think I should ask Walter Williams, and I'll do my best to get as many of those questions in as I can. Remember, you're helping us pay our bills every time you make an Amazon purchase through the Amazon widget at TomWoodsRadio.com. We certainly appreciate that. See you tomorrow for Bob Murphy, everybody. Thanks for listening. The Tom Woods Show.